7. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> and we'll just at, at the beginning here just read verses 1 through 6. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman who hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful impulses which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we're delivered from the law that being dead in which we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. <clears throat> All right, Romans uh, 7, at least the beginning here, actually, well, mainly the beginning here is similar to Romans 6 <clears throat> um, in that a death has to take place at the cross. Um, it is a continuation of that, but Romans 7 is coming up with a different angle. It has a different angle than Romans 6. Uh, Ro in Romans 6, um, you know, it just hits that point over and over and over that we are dead, or we are supposed to die with Christ, that that death is supposed to be enacted into our being. <clears throat> but in Romans 7, it is not approaching it so much as we must die, but our old husband must die. That's what we just got through reading. <clears throat> and. Um, and so it is focusing on this death and on that, that, that it's not just that we're saved, but kind of a different angle, that we're remarried, that we're remarried. And uh, Romans 7 here in these first six verses take us back. Romans 5, it takes us back to that love, it takes us back to um, what's in his heart. And this is what I implied last class in Romans 6. <clears throat> Here it is saying that he wants a bride. Here it is saying that he wants us married. Here it is saying, I mean, uh, where was that? Um, uh, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised. This is, this is the Spirit of God speaking on behalf of Jesus, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised. And um, so Romans 5, you see it, and you know, as you remember what Romans 5 was about, it's about his love. It's about his love. But Romans 7 is about our love to him. And I thank God. I thank God that Paul was open to the Spirit to not just make it all about his love towards us and to make it in such a manner that we would want to be married to another. And that we would hear even his heart in that he would put those scriptures. Of all, the, of all the Old Testament examples that could have been used, the Lord chooses. And the Spirit chooses on behalf of the Lord because he knows his heart. He chose, he chose to 
address us in a context of <clears throat> being joined with him as, as him as a husband and us as a bride, us as his wife. So <clears throat> Romans 5 is, is God love. But Romans 7 is bride love. Um, I've had thoughts along different times in my walk with the Lord about this phrase, and I, you know, it just has stuck with me, the vulnerability of God. And I, I think there are people that would refute such a thing, God is not vulnerable. He's God. You know what I'm saying? He's God, so he couldn't possibly be vulnerable. But he made himself vulnerable. I mean, the cross is vulnerability. It's the vulnerability of God. But, but there's a deeper vulnerability than just physical vulnerability or, or, you know, emotional vulnerability based on how you're treated. But this is a vulnerability that Almighty God, with all power and all ability to be stable, has made himself vulnerable for her. And that's... And that's, um, that was a hard issue before it became a physical issue on, a, on a two pieces of wood. I mean, can you see that? That there had to be something to take him to Calvary. There had to be something greater than just love for sinners. And it put him in the most vulnerable place he could ever be in, that he was ever in. You know, you hear stories or you see movies and you say, well, he did it for love. But this kind of vulnerability is, is um, <laughs> I, I don't know. He's in Romans 7 of all places. He's revealing the vulnerability of his longing for bride love that you might be married to another. He's doing that at a place where she, quote unquote, is about to come unglued. You know? And he's still... You know, his heart can't change. You know, our heart changes. It does. But his doesn't change. What's true in him is true in him because it is him. It's not true to him. You know, it's not a belief system to him. It's not something he's doing. It's not something that, you know, it is God is love but it is more than God is love as most of the time when we say that we say God is love therefore he'd be willing to die for sinners but Ephesians 5 really addresses this about he gave himself for her a bride the church gave himself who loved her and gave himself to have her because that's what Romans 5 is about it's a great mystery it is a mystery it is it is so a mystery to most people because all they see is oh let's let's get married and we'll just you know I'll love you like Jesus oh sh sh shut up you know you, you, you know come on that's not anything that you would do is not even close to his love you know I mean, it's, that, that would be like sitting in a traffic, bad traffic, and saying, oh, my God, this is the sufferings of Job. <laughs> this is not the sufferings of Job, okay? You, they're not even close, buddy. It's just a little bit of traffic. But that's how, that's how 
dramatic we are. And we have, and, and in that, see, we pull him down in his emotions and his way and his heart, better word, heart, we pull it down into some little penny any situation and then we say, oh, I'm fellowshipping in his sufferings. And it's just, it is heartbreaking if you really get just a glimpse of, you know, Just get a glimpse of who, who loved the church and he gave himself for her. See, that's, that's a death on the cross that has nothing to do with sin. That's a giving of himself that has nothing to do with the creator. Well, it's my mess. I created these people. I better come down and clean it up. Or I'm the responsible party here. Uh, you know, even though this is their fault, I will. No, this is something. It, it is something that is a mystery. And it says that. This is a great mystery. It doesn't say it's a mystery. It says this is a great mystery. But really, I'm not talking about you and your little penny ante marriages. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Can you see Jesus in this, or do you just see it as an excuse, scriptural excuse for getting married? I started to say for having sex, but for getting married, you know? So I see, I see here in Romans 7 at the very beginning, him being vulnerable, him showing his longing for bride love, not just sinner love or Christian love, Christian love. I can see Jesus sitting on the throne going, oh, show me Christian love. It's like, please don't, I've seen it. It's not that good. <laughs> but now with this and bringing this up he's not talking about his love for us he's, he's hoping that there'll be a love back to him it's uh, his desire his love from us now like it's your turn <laughs> I, I totally gave myself I totally made myself vulnerable and, you know, Romans 5 talks about that love. Remember how, it, how glorious Romans 5 presents that? And then it uses that, that thing much more. You remember that? I don't think we explored it. I mean, we didn't explore it fully. Look over in Romans 5, and I can just quickly take you through it. Romans 5. And this is the much, what I always call the much more factor. <clears throat> Romans 5, verse 9. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, uh, halfway through, by the, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Do you see all of that is really so much more than just saved or reconciled? And yet, all of that much more is for us, and he's not getting any yet. I, that may not mean much to anybody. I think it does to him. Anyway, let's, since we're here, look at verse uh, 15. And not only as the offense, so also is the free gift, for if through the offense, uh, for if through the offense of one many are dead, much more the grace of God and the free gift, the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And then there's the much more again. Much more than just salvation, much more than just, but it is abounding to us. And then verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. 
He's, he's so much more. He's the one. He's what's much more. Ultimately, he is. And then verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more. And in all of that, and all of that, and that's what I was trying to explain in our last class in Romans 5, we see, we see this poured out one. We see this one that every ounce and every step and every verse, he is, he is much more, he's giving us much more than what we deserved. He's not just saving us from a prison that we deserve or saving us from an electric chair that we deserve. He is taking us out of all of that and he's making us one with him and we're the we're the we're the big benefactors <clears throat> I was thinking keep your place in Romans I was thinking of second Corinthians uh, chapter 3 second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 It just simply says this, for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth. And folks, that which is done away isn't just our old CDs or our old habits or our old, you know, I used to smoke and now I don't, I'm, the, that which is done away is us and what remains is oneness with Christ. That's what remains. That's the eternal. That's the only thing that's going to remain. And so what we do is we only see this in light of what we want to enjoy. And we, we addressed this last class, but I want you to see it now in light of all the much more that he gives us and all the how little we give back to him much less, you know. We get the much more and he gets the much less. But in truth, in his heart, I mean, I just see, I just see his heart, you know. I just see the way he words this. For if, if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. And it's what remains in his heart is this union. Yeah, that's all that remains. Not just, you know, I'm a big savior and everybody's going to, you know, but this union, she may not see it, right? Right? She may, she may see it somewhat. She may, whatever, but this is how he sees it. If whatever that was, was glorious, it's done away. Oh, I mean, I just hear him, hear him speaking. Much more that which remains is glorious. You know? Can you see the, the, the groom? The, can you see the beloved? Can you see his viewing in the Song of Solomon her? And, and he views her from, you know, that eternal perspective. But, she's, but Hosea, she may not be there at all. You know, Jesus, is that a pipe dream? You know, I mean, it could be. It depends on us. I mean, it's our heart. When the heart turns to the Lord, whose heart? Ours, not his. But we're, we're still waiting for him to do something more, much more. I need much more. And it's still about us. It's still about what we're dragging him through and what we're pulling him into and stuff that he doesn't, he doesn't even want to be there. It's not even, it's like, you know, you see it in the Song of Solomon. You know, you see it in the book of Revelation. Come up here. You know, come away, my beloved. Come away. But, but it's always this, you know, I mean, we pull him into things in this earth that he wasn't even involved with when he was in the earth. You know what I'm saying? He, and yet we shove his face in it. 
We do. We shove his face in and we say, and there's never a thought, never a thought of his heart. What? I'm just thinking we might get through some of this here. All right, let's look at uh, back to Romans 7, and we're going to look in verse uh, 15 through 24. Most of you are familiar with somewhat of this. <clears throat> Romans 7, 15, For that which I do, I understand not. Boy, that's the truth. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Which that verse tells you absolutely, positively, that strength of will still won't get it. There has to be something higher in you. Verse 20, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but <clears throat> sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. <clears throat> it's almost like the inward man is in a cage, in a, in a prison cell. It's like, okay, um, Jesus, you're in me. But we go, well, if I could just... Find the key to let Jesus out. The key is your death. It is. It's what this is all talking about. But we're still trying to get him to keep us alive and hand us the key. Verse 23, but I see then, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into King James says, captivity to the law. We'll, we're going to address that here pretty quick. Captivity to the law. You, did you know that there's a difference actually between the law and legalism? Because yes. the law is good, holy, righteous, and da-da-da-da, and it speaks of Christ. If you have eyes to see, Christ can be revealed there. But if you're legalistic, you're just a Pharisee. Not speaking specifically to anyone in this room. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And the only way to get delivered from the body of that death is for you to die and then let him be the deliverance. All right. So Babylon is like a foreign head. It's like the law. It's like a foreign head that is now dictating. You know, God put Israel under the law, right? And God sent Israel into Babylon, right? All of the above. All of the above. So in Romans 7, or in the captivity, we are Judah without our Jerusalem. We have no capital. We have no seat of government. Yeah, that's right. We are ungoverned. We are, you could say we're free. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Right. But the point being, kind of comparing this to the captivity, that now we've 
frittered away any hope to have Jerusalem as our capital, and we have carried away, and we have a foreign head, and only, only some sit by the side of Chabar and weep. And they were told, sing the songs of Zion, but we cannot sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land. Oh, the, the agony of knowing now what they should have known then. Does that make sense? Because that did happen. Amen? It did happen. So under the law, I mean, uh, being in captivity is being under the law. And it is a foreign head. You say, well, God, but God gave the law. That's what everybody always says, but God gave the law. Again, yeah. Somebody, somebody even said to me recently, well, you know, God let Moses allow us to have divorce. He allows divorce. And I said, yeah, because of the hardness of your heart. That's why. But remember, to God, it was never about people. In Romans 7, the first couple of chapters prove that. And we'll even go back and hit that a little bit. It was never about the people getting married or not married. It was always about what was eternal. And he was talking always about his heart. Jesus said, because of the hardness of your heart, he knows, he feels this thing to the core. Because everything around him is legalistic and no one recognizes him as the groom. So he says that and we just go, oh, see, Jesus is, is uh, allowing us to have divorce. Again, we never think about him, you know. We're just thinking about ourselves. Well, can I get divorced or not? And we go, but I mean, we are. And then we go like this. We go, well, I guess I can. The only drawback is the hardness of my heart, but I can. I can. So that's not so bad. Being under the law is coming short of the glory of God. Short of the glory. Not all have sinned. Right? Amen? But we've also come short of the glory of God. And, and uh, what is it, 2 Corinthians 3 there that we read from? Ooh, that whole chapter is all about the glory. It is. But it's found in the face of Jesus. And we're changed from one degree of glory to the other. From one actually kind of glory to the other. I don't want to get into all that. All right. So my little subtitle here is The Need for a Change of Head. A change of head in Romans 7 is marriage or union. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. That's how, because that, do we need to go back and read verses uh, 1 through uh, 6 again? A change of head there is union with another. Okay? A change of head is also death to the old head. You see that? It can't be, you can't, you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. The Bible you know, a lot of people view the Bible as a, a book of, you know, finding out how to live a moral life or, you know, what I should do, direction for my life or what I shouldn't do, which would make it really, you know, the not, tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, which could be coming to God's garden and only finding that here. Um, but there's a tree of life in it. It teaches Christ. It teaches Christ crucified. It, it does. And all of the Old Testament, all through there, it is not the stories that we think that it is. 
I was talking with John, carried me and, and Deb to the airport when we went to Ireland. I didn't think I was going to bring this up, but I think I'm going to do it. I'm just in the mood to, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Uh, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Y'all say goodbye to me as a pastor, and I'll, I'll be on my way, which right now, 2 Samuel, you're welcome. I'm hoping that's what it is, because I jotted this down some time back, and it looks like We're right. Okay, Second Samuel 11, starting with verse 15. <clears throat> this is David giving Joab a letter about Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. <clears throat> and he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. It came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When thou has finished telling the matter of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he then say unto thee, Why approached ye so near unto the city when you did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of that guy? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in that place? Why went ye near the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Oh, never mind, it's okay. You know, I'm a man of war, but you know, we can, we can pass over that right quick. <clears throat> then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that uh, the, the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. It is a horrible thing. to put the old husband to death to get his wife. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He put our old husband to death to get his wife. You want to read it again? It's right there. Jesus killed our old husband. Some of your old husbands needed to die. <laughs> so I want to tell you something. Listen carefully. You, you are the true Bathsheba. In, in, the, in the rightest way possible. That was just a shadow. But you are the true one of his heart that King David, the beloved of the Lord, wanted to marry so that you would have his fruit, Solomon. And Jedediah was Solomon's other name, which means what? Beloved of the Lord, beloved of the Lord which means... In, in Romans 7, it says that you might bring forth fruit unto God, that you would bring forth the beloved of the Lord, Jedediah Solomon. Now, I know that shocks everybody. Like I said, I won't. 
I resign. How about that? <clears throat> um, Jesus didn't put the old man on the front line and send him out to be killed. Jesus took him into himself and went to that cross. Jesus bore the death of it. Jesus bore the death of it. But it doesn't change his heart for his bride. Doesn't change his motive, which is to, to have the true, this is not the shadow with all of its murkiness, the true Bathsheba so that he could bring forth Jedediah, the beloved of his heart. That's it. That's right. You know, that's the Lord. Yes. And that's always the case. That's always the case. But it is interesting that that, that story, if you let the Holy Spirit breathe, does speak of Christ in relationship to his bride. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the shadow. He wasn't. You know what I'm saying? In the shadow there, he wasn't. In the shadow, it was, he was a good man. And, well, in the, that's, in the greatest truth, that's exactly right. You know, and I think that's your point is that, you know, whether, you, whether he's, whether Adam appears good to people, or is some perverse man? You know, we justify killing the perverse man. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's one of the that's one of the things you have to come to grips with. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want your good either, and that's what Joseph's trying to say. That old man, I don't care how cleaned up he is, he is an abomination to God. Your old head, your old husband, and we say, you know. You know, we got some single girls here. Well, I'm a single girl. I don't have a head. Yeah, you do. And it's inside. It's right up here. And it's going off all the time. And it's telling you stuff. And it's guiding you. And it's, it has to, it has to come down. I mean, you hear, you, I mean, you hear the book of Revelation. I mean, the lamb is rising in the book of Revelation. Amen. I mean, being finally seen as who he really is. And at the same time, Babylon must come down, come out from among, get a, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's all about getting rid of that captivity. So I, I'll be honest with you, I understand if, if someone, Skype or somewhere listen to this and go, my God. What a, you know, what a perversion of scriptures or whatever. It doesn't, it do, it's not a perversion of the scriptures to read Romans 7, 1 through 6 and to see that that's exactly what he wanted to do, but he did it in the right way. He did it by the cross and he did it by self-giving. And he did it to put something that needed to be put to death that was never meant to rule. Mm -hmm. Never meant to rule. Mm -hmm. And take back what he loved and what he always desired from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. And to, my God, marry that. Mm -hmm. In the truest sense of the word, you know what I mean? The truest reality, greater than any stinking wedding we've ever seen you know, not based on all of that, but based on who, who can speak for God? Who can speak for his heart in relationship to this stuff? I, you know, I mean, sometimes I just, 
even as I was meditating on this before I left, I just, I just wanted to go hide my head under a pillow and not show up. Um, I, you know, I'll chime in with, you know, some sometimes people say, well, I, I, I got a problem with you, Randy. I got a problem with me too, you know? Who can speak for God? I try, but that's sort of ridiculous. I mean, in, the, in a real sense, to, especially hard issues. Who can speak for God? When Who can speak for Jesus? Who can speak for, you know, the groom, the beloved? Who can speak for his heart? God, I'm just nothing. I'm just nothing. But I, my prayer is always um, that the Holy Spirit would always be here and that he could speak for the groom. So if what I've shared offends anyone, I, I'm sorry and I repent. My heart is never to do that. It's not. I'm not I don't try to look up. You know, that's the problem with the Holy Spirit. I don't try to look up this stuff. He goes, hey, do you know what that's about? And he starts, and he says, turn over here. And then I'm going, before I know it, I'm into it. And I'm going, I'm going to be in trouble for this. You know that, don't you? <laughs> but um, I, I don't believe that I have the stature or anything to speak for the heart of God. I believe that God, Jesus himself said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will speak of me. And so if he doesn't do that, you know, if, I mean, if he didn't do that here, if he doesn't do that with people on Skype or people <clears throat> look at this later, <clears throat> then I'm an idiot standing up here trying to speak for God. Do you understand what I'm saying? That I, then that's what I am. And then I deserve to be stoned, which is... I do not resist what I deserve. So always please pray that the Holy Spirit could communicate the heart of Jesus in our gatherings. Always look to him. Don't look to me. Don't look to anybody else. Just pray and always, when we come in and we gather, to just be sensitive to him. Lord, I just, I just love you. Just love you, Jesus. I love you so much. Forgive me, Lord, for my futile words, my lack of spirit, my emptiness of being to be able to in any way say anything as if it was represented you. And somehow allow like Mary, who was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and Christ was formed, that I can be overshadowed so that Christ can be formed in others. We need you, Holy Spirit. If we love Jesus, we will pursue you. We will want to hear your voice. We will want the movement, this, the sound of your wings in movement on the word, on Jesus. And Lord, if I, Lord, if I'm just not adequate enough for you. I ask you to, to remove me. To let those who love you so much more and that will 
deliver you so more, so much more faithfully to be given a place. Bless your people, Lord. Bless your sheep. Take care. In Jesus' name.